Psalm chapter 17 tonight. So we look at this psalm, and a little bit longer psalm, we'll break it down into three parts again. And the theme for this psalm, I would submit tonight, is deliverance. Or being set free. Maybe you've wrestled before, and, and eventually they, you get pinned, and then you, you get let free. I am not a wrestler. There's some great wrestlers we've had come through this place. My initiation to wrestling was in the eighth grade. And we had wrestling in PE class. And there I was. I was a chunky eighth grader. I've been chunky most of my entire life. It's just my nature and, and what I'm stuck with. My metabolism is the speed of a turtle. It's been run over. Here I was in eighth grade. And the young man, or should I say the beast that I got to wrestle, his name was Mark Huff. It's funny how you remember certain names in life, is it not? Mark was a man among boys in the eighth grade. Here I am, a five foot nothing. And here's Mark, nine foot three. <laughs> Here I am, you couldn't see my muscles if I flexed and pulled and twisted, and Mark rippled with muscles. And our PE teacher said, J.D., you're going to wrestle Mark. And for the next few minutes, I was tossed around the mat. I saw the whole thing, front and back, up and down. I think he rolled me up in an action and stood me in the corner, I feel like. And I was so glad when it was done. So thankful. Do you like wrestling? Not that day I didn't. Not that day. And you could probably identify with some similar circumstances. But there are those times in life when something happens and we're just glad that we're done. Perhaps it's a hard day at work. And everything goes wrong. And everything you touch doesn't turn to gold, but turns to mold. And you're making a mess. And you're just glad it's done. Here in Psalm chapter 17, we see some prayer. The psalmist will write, David will write to us, to the Lord and, and to us, about deliverance. And I'm so thankful that our God delivers not just in eternity, but in the everyday. He delivers for every day of your life. He doesn't leave you high and dry throughout this life. God is able and willing and desiring to help all of the time. Let's begin in Psalm 17, verse 1. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thy ear unto me, and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against thee, or them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. From the wicked that oppress me, from the, my deadly enemies who compass me about, they are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes, bowing down to the earth, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord. Disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men, which are thy hand. O Lord, from the men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children and leave the rest of the substance to their babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Lord, so we approach this time tonight, we need you. Lord, as I speak, I'm asking for your help, that you would help me to clearly explain and preach from this passage truth that would glorify you, that would honor you. Lord, help this truth be a help and a blessing to us and encouragement tonight. Lord, there are needs, there are issues, there are problems that many may not even know about in this room, but you do. Lord, your word is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, what appears tonight are thoughts 
May it reveal the intents of our heart. And Lord, may we respond to you in obedience and faith. Lord, thank you for your truth, for this time. We ask for your help. Lord, we need you. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. I thank and ask. Amen. Perhaps you've needed deliverance in life. Perhaps you've been in a, maybe a small situation or maybe even a large situation. It could be a, as small as a small bill or a loan, all the way to some type of kidnapping and threat on your life. It could be a spoken burden or it could be an unspoken burden. It could be something that is known or it could be largely unknown to those around but still come to the point where we need deliverance. We need to be, quote, set free. The psalm that we discover has been written to us by David. Sometimes in these psalms we'll know the background, we'll know what he was going through. This one, we don't know. We don't know if he was young in his life or old in his life at the time he wrote this psalm. We don't know if the problem that he's facing is because of his choices or outside of his control. We don't know if he's in a cave or in the palace. We don't know if everyone has rejected him or just merely he's in a state of depression and oppression. But we do know this, that David is pleading and asking for God to set him free or for God to deliver him. And I'm kind of glad we don't know the whole situation. Because if we knew the whole situation, perhaps we'd limit our God. And we, and we would say, well, God is good for the, the saving, delivering here, but maybe not over here. But tonight, my friends, I can tell you that God is good to deliver in all aspects and all problems and all situations of life. He's that good. In this psalm, I see three requests for deliverance that I want to look at tonight that I think will be applicable and helpful to us tonight. The first one we find in verses 4 and 5. Now, verses 1, 2, and 3, as David prays, he says, he claims, he says, Lord, you've searched me, you know me, and you know that there's not error, there's not transgression, there's not iniquity in my life. In a sense, he's saying, Lord, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but between you and me, we're okay. We're right. Now, it would go... To, to mention tonight that it is so important that we are right, not just here, but here. I can fool you, and you can fool me. But I can't fool God, and you can't fool God. But you know sometimes who we can fool just seems odd. We can fool ourselves. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For us a man so that she also reap. You ever played a game where you try to guess like a coin in a hand, maybe with a small child? And you hide a quarter, maybe your parents did this with you, and then they take out the quarter from both hands. Oh, you're lost there, oh, you're lost there, right? You could trick a small child, but have you tried to play the game with yourself? Put a coin in your hand, all right, Owl, which hand's a coin in? Oh, man, I always lose this game. Oh, not my right hand. Oh, my friend... Don't be deceived by your heart tonight. Don't be deceived by your flesh. Listen, make sure you're right with God. And David said, listen, I, my faith is unfeigned. It, it's correct before the Almighty. It is good. I have a right relationship with him, and I'm asking for his deliverance. And then look at verse 4 and 5 where David asks these things. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. David says, because I've looked at your word and kept the word of thy lips... I have been kept from the paths of the destroyer. Now remember that and look at verse number five. Hold up my goings in thy, what's that word there? Paths. Verses four and five, you have a little bit of a contrast in these two paths, which I believe is a contrast in life. In verse number four, David says, I have been delivered from the wrong path because I've kept thy word. Because I've listened to your instruction, I followed your guidance. This word that's used in verse number four is the word that's often in the Old Testament used to describe a negative path, a wrong path. Not always, but almost always, this word has a sense of being broad, being open. It makes me think of what Jesus said, uh, the broad way that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. 
If you were to go through your Bible, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read you a few verses. In Job chapter 22, this word is used. It says, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden? Here, that same word is described a way where the wicked way, where the wicked men, it's the old way. You remember in the New Testament that the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a, help me if you know it, new creature, a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. But I imagine you, like me, still feel a pull for the old way, the old path. The path of the wicked. And David says, I need deliverance, and I find deliverance when I keep your word. If you were to continue in, your word, in the Bible, you'd find in Psalm chapter 119, this same word used again. Where the psalmist asks this question. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Same word. The question is answered in that psalm by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You see, this way, this path, in, this, in Psalm chapter 17, the path of the destroyer, is a way that needs to be cleansed. It needs to be changed. And we find deliverance. We find the freedom when we listen to the word. Later on in Psalm chapter 119, this word's used again. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end, the end is not life, it's not right. It's not good, it's the ways of death. It's destruction. It's corruption. One of the most beguiling, one of the most uh, greatest tricks of the evil one, of the devil, is to convince us that our way is the right way. The way I was raised, the way that makes sense to me, you know, the way that I can, logically, I can logically see this path, oh my goodness, it just, boy, I have to follow it. It's broad, it's wide, and it's the old path. And David says, I need deliverance from this path, which I can quickly, which I can easily begin to not just walk down, if we're honest, to not just dog, jog down, but if we're honest, we can begin to run down this path as quickly as you can snap your fingers. My friends, I bet, I imagine you like myself can find yourself on this old path as like that. Someone cut you off in the road. And how quickly the old nature, the flesh, the old path gets you right there. Boy, I get good insurance. I'm going to run them off the road. I hope they get pulled over. The old path, the old way. How quick our pride rears its ugly head. This is the path that we need deliverance from. But there's a verse that many of you have claimed for your life verse. This word is used in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and help me if you know it, and he shall direct thy... Yeah, absolutely. You know what God wants to do? He wants to bring deliverance. He wants to set you free and direct this path. Tomorrow morning, he wants to give you the direction for, the, for Monday. And Tuesday, this path. You see, verse number four says, Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Number, verse number five, hold up my goings in thy paths. Oh, I love this word. This word is also used in Scripture and other places. And almost always, this word is used in a positive, eternal sense. In fact, one of the most, or one way, it says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 11, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. But probably my favorite passage where this, where this word is used is found in Psalm 23, verse number 3. He restoreth my soul. 
He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. That's this word right here. And David says, listen, your word has kept me from my inclination. Your word has kept me from that wicked way. It's, it's here. I can see it. I can feel it. And your word has delivered me. And your word has delivered me not just from this, but it's delivered me to this path of righteousness. And in this path of righteousness, my soul is restored. My friends, there are those days when our soul seems to be just burdened and weighed down. And you find the path of righteousness. I bet this happened to you if you spend some time with God. And you spend some time with God, and it's like God has filled up your spiritual gas tank. He's released you from the burden from that other path. He's released you from the sorrow, and you have met face-to-face with God. And you find the deliverance that he brings on his path. And my goodness, it is refreshing. It is restoring. It is energizing. It's contagious. What's got into you, God? Your reaction doesn't make any sense. You're right, but I spent some time with the Lord, and he has restored my soul. He's directed my path. My path was headed down this way. It wasn't a good path, but he delivered me. David says, I need the deliverance. You see, we didn't come here. We're not here just to deliver ourselves or to navigate this life by ourselves. I read a story about Yogi Berra and Hank Aaron, both baseball players. Hank Aaron was the chief power hitter at that time for the Milwaukee Braves. Apparently, as this story I read goes, uh, they were playing in the World Series, and Yogi, as a catcher, was keeping his usual banter and smack talk up. Apparently... As Hank Aaron came to the plate to bat, Yogi tried to distract him by saying, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark. Apparently, Hank Aaron didn't say anything, but on the next pitch, hit it into the left field bleachers. Ran around the bases. He came back across home plate, as a story that I read goes, he tags home plate, looks at Yogi Bear and says, I didn't come here to read the bat. <laughs> My friends, you and I are here. You and I are not here to navigate ourselves. We're not here to read the bat. God can bring deliverance. And he sets our feet, all right, from this place and this path onto his path. Like Heinz feet up here. And we find our soul is restored. Not only is is deliverance in a path, but number two, there's deliverance in oppression. Verse number six through verse number 14, we see a number of verses where David is crying out and praying because there's some trouble from in and from out, from within and from without. There's some external issues and some internal issues. Throughout David's Psalms, we will often find him praying for help in his enemies. Now, if you have studied all the life of David, you would re- remember and find out as you study David that he was a victorious fighter. David, all, all the stories that we have and accounts that we have, did not lose very often. Not only was he well ver- versed in the art of warcraft, he had a secret weapon named Jehovah. And God said, if I'm on your side, uh, then you will chase Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of enemies. All right, I will fight for you. Now, God made that promise, but I still love the fact that David is continually going to God for deliverance. That David just didn't, it doesn't look like that David just woke up and said, Well, you know what? I am pretty good. I'm pretty good with a sling. I mean, me and Goliath, I mean, he didn't stand a chance. No, David even then said, listen, I come to you, but, but God, God is going to energize. God will work in the situation. And here David, as he often does in the Psalms, he asks for deliverance from enemies, from the wicked, from deadly enemies. I mean, David, in a real sense, had people that were swinging for him and were trying to kill him, assassinate him, destroy him. Verse number 7, particularly we see this request, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. 
This is not a surprise, my friends, when people will rise up against us. Jesus said, don't be surprised when the world hates you. They hated me first. There will be opposition in this life. And David says, there are those that rise up against me. But you save, God saves by his right hand, those that put their trust in him. I need deliverance from trouble that can come from without. But I love what David says in verse number 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. So many stories, so many accounts of God's unique hand of protection on his people. Not only in the Bible do we see it, when God used miraculous methods to solve problems, from mirage to wind to hornets. He used all of that. Even in current times, we see God, and I know we're going to get to heaven and find out that God did so much more than we can see. I know we're going to go to heaven and find out how God's hand was on us. And I love David's prayer. Lord, put me under the shadow of your wings. Let me have your protection. Let me have your rescuing, your deliverance around me. All right, so that even when someone approaches, they can't even touch me because your power is around me. Your protection is covering me. You see, trouble is distracting. Trouble is depressing. I heard a story that the police are trying to stop a group of shoplifters. And these shoplifters would work, in the account that I read, uh, they were considered a roving band of thieves. They would enter into a store as a group and one or two would separate themselves from the group and start a loud commotion. While this commotion was going on, and the clerks and the customers were all turned in their attention to this commotion and to this problem, the other thieves, the robbers, would then take that opportunity to steal from the store. They'd walk out. Eventually, the store owner would understand their merchandise and cash was gone, sometimes hours, perhaps even days afterwards. And the police worked for a while to find this particular group of thieves that would rob and steal using the distraction technique. You know what? If the devil, if he can't send us and condemn us to hell, then he'd love to distract us on the way. And he will send a trouble across our path to distract us, to keep us, to keep us from serving God with our life, to keep us focused on a problem. Man, isn't it, isn't it sad? It's sad how quickly we can be distracted by problems. Something happens and we begin to pray and it's almost like, Lord, are you ever going to solve this problem? Forgetting that he solved all of these problems before. Isn't it sad how you can hurt your finger? You can hurt your finger and forget how healthy the rest of you is. Forget how good it is to walk and talk and to function correctly because your finger hurts. Yet in life, a little problem can cause a great distraction and great trouble. And David here says, I need your deliverance. I need your rescuing distractions. I read a silly story about theft again. Petty theft was happening at the factory. And the owners were not happy, so they put some guards out front to stop the, to stop the employees from stealing. Well, one guard knew one of the workers, and the worker's name was Bill. The first evening the Bill came out, he came out with a wheelbarrow and a suspicious-looking bag inside the wheelbarrow. Of course, the guard stopped Bill and said, Bill, what you have in the bag? He said, sawdust and dirt. Okay, Bill. Well, look, so sure enough, Bill opened up the bag, and there was sawdust and dirt, and okay, went on his way and went home that night. Next night, same situation, there's a bag, what's in it? Sawdust and dirt, and sure enough, there it was, and this happened for a few weeks, until the guard just became frustrated, he goes, something is up there, I just can't put my finger on it. So one night, Bill comes out, and he said, Bill, okay, stop, Bill, 
I'm going to ask you the question again, but listen, I know you, you know me, I've known you a long time, something's going on here. All right, I'm not going to say anything, but tell me, what you're smuggling out of here, and I'll let you go. And Bill says, it's easy, wheelbarrows. My friends, without the deliverance from Jesus Christ, we can miss what's happening. We can miss what's going on. We can miss what God wants to do in our life. We need deliverance in our path, deliverance from oppression. But let's look at one more deliverance I find in this passage. Found in verse number 15, where David says this, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. You know, the last thing that I think David is asking for deliverance from is from himself. From him. I think here David knows exactly what he's asking. Perhaps David has already had this large moral failing with Bathsheba. Perhaps he's already encountered a time when he had the people numbered and saw them destroyed by a plague by his own cho choosing, by his choice. Perhaps David understands that what he does and how he is does not always please God. And he says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. God, I don't want to see me. I don't want to see my ugliness. I don't want to see my reflection. I don't want to see my own talent and my own life. Lord, I want to see you. I want to see your face. I want to see your likeness. And if I can, he's asking, I want to see your likeness inside of me. There are some that even think that David is referencing back to creation where God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. Remember that God said, let us make man in our image that in the perfect creation man was made in the image of God. The fall has hindered that image. It has tarnished that image. And one day... When we receive our glorified bodies, we will truly reflect the image of Jesus Christ like we ought to. But along the way, Christ wants to do something in us, and he wants others to see him. He doesn't want them to see us. And here the psalmist, David, says, listen, deliver me not just in my path where I'll keep your word in the path that restores my soul. Deliver me not just from trouble that'll come from without and will distract me, but God, deliver me from myself. Do something inside of me. I'm not content to be me. I don't just want to continue to be me. I want you to change me, and I'll be satisfied. I'll be content. I'll be happy when I behold your likeness. You ever pray for patience? Don't. Seems like God always answers that prayer. Of course, I say that answer tongue in cheek. Pray for faith? God answers that one. Pray to be like Jesus Christ? The Bible says that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ, to the day of Christ. God has begun at the moment of salvation a work in our life, in my life and in your life, and it's to make us in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. He carefully crafts our life situations to be sure to cut off those edges that don't please him, that don't reflect him well. And sometimes if we're not careful, we hold on to that faulty image. This is the way I am. But it's like God says, but it's not the way I want you to be. This is the only way I know but let me show you another way. This is what I feel, so feel it from my perspective, with my power. May we have that claim like the psalmist, I shall be satisfied, I shall be content, I will be full when I awake with thy likeness. He asked for the divine filling Deep in the faculties of a soul. Most of us are familiar with the slogan, prayer changes things. Often displayed on billboards, memes, social media, sometimes on church bulletins and dust cover 
of a book. But if David were to maybe perhaps pen this psalm, he wouldn't say prayer changes things. He would say, may my prayer change me. Sometimes, my friend, we pray for prayer to change things. Lord, change this situation. Change this circumstance. Change this problem. Change this person. When really we say, we ought to be saying, Lord, I want you to change me. And I'll be satisfied. I'll be content. Not just when I feel maybe the pressure changes, the problem solved, but I'll be content when I awake and I behold your likeness. Thank you.